Uh, good evening, everybody, and a warm welcome to the third in the series of Pastoral Dialogues, uh, being co-organized by Kalpavriksh, Center for Pastoralism and Indian Commoner. Uh, pastoralism has contributed enormously to India's food security, biodiversity and arts and crafts, and also provides some form of sustenance to nearly 30 to 35 million people. Yet, narratives about pastoralism as a sustainable livelihood are more or less invisible and they've been left out of policy spaces. So the idea behind hosting these dialogues was to create a space for conversations around various aspects of Indian pastoralism by getting researchers, civil society activists, as well as members of pastoral communities to give, a, to give us a glimpse into this livelihood. Just to um, give a little, little bit of a background uh, to the organizations uh, hosting this dialogue, uh, Kaipavriksh has been working on environmental issues uh, with the belief that the country can develop meaningfully only when ecological sustainability and social equity can be guaranteed to all its citizens. The Center for Pastoralism undertakes research aimed at understanding pastoral ecosystems it develops collaborative programs to enhance the livelihood security of pastoral groups and also undertakes outreach activities to educate the wider society about the contribution of pastoralists. And the Indian Commoner is a forum set up to discuss the current state of common pool resources in India 
and other parts of the world. Uh, today, we are very happy to have uh, Said Hess and Natasha Maru with us. And they will be exploring the, uh, the pastoralism's adaptive capacity in the face of uh, climate-related challenges. Their work uh, straddles two different drylands in Africa and the bunny grasslands in India. Uh, to introduce them, SED is with the Climate Change Group of the International Institute for Environment and Development. He works on research and capacity building on climate resilience, productivity, and equity in Africa. Natasha is pursuing her PhD at the University of Sussex in the Institute of Development Studies. And she's been a consultant on pastoral issues with international agriculture and sustainability organizations. Before I hand over to uh, Natasha and uh, Seth, uh, just a few uh, announcements that we'll be keeping the microphones and uh, videos of the participants uh, closed when you enter because we want Seth and uh, Natasha to be uh, uh, in the limelight, so to speak. Uh, once they are done with their um, conversation, we will also be taking uh, questions. Uh, so it would be really great if, uh, if you have any questions, if you could put them up in the chat box and we could take them towards the end of uh, Natasha and Seth's talk. So without uh, further ado, I would like to hand, it, hand the platform over to Seth and Natasha. Thanks, guys. You can take over. Thanks, Mina. Thanks for introducing us. Said, I think uh, your mic is still muted. You might want to check. It. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Thanks for the introductions, and it, and and thank you also for inviting me to this. It's a it's a real pleasure. Um, I was thinking back the last time I engaged with a, a, such a large group of colleagues from, from India on pastoral issues. It uh, actually goes back to the Living Lightly conference, which took place, I think, in December 2016, and where I, had, I was very lucky to be able to come. And, and, and I, I, it was a real eye-opener for me, that conference, because uh, having worked mainly in Africa on pastoral uh, issues, I, I wasn't really aware of the... The, the massive diversity and complexity and, and richness of, mm -hmm. of pastoralism in India, uh, ranging from pastoralism in, in the Himalayas uh, to those uh, working in more dryland environments. So, uh, yeah, so it's a real pleasure to, to join again, albeit um, at distance uh, and online. I think uh, the pleasure is ours as well. Um, in fact, uh, the organizers for these dialogues, uh, Center for Pastoralism, Kalpavriksh, and the Indian Commoner, they're also associated with the Living Lightly Conference. Mm -hmm. So I think, I mean, uh, thanks to them to have uh, to having brought you here with us again. Um, I think uh, we have now uh, the challenge to have this dialogue and discussion <laughs> um, and we have quite a bit of audience also so thank you for everybody who's come to hear us as well um, but yeah the topic for today's discussion was uh, on uh, pastoralism and climate change and they are two areas I mean I think they're two big areas of work uh, that are very often spoken about together and I think uh, I couldn't imagine a better person to have this discussion with than you, because you've had this long career uh, working on both pastoralist issues as well as climate change. Uh, but, you know, I'm really curious, and I think maybe that's a good point to begin at, uh, is to, you know, hear a bit of your story, to know how you became involved in these things. How did you come to pastoralism and things like that? Okay. I mean, it, like many things in life, it was a bit of an accident. Uh, <laughs> I had just finished my MA at uh, School of Oriental and African Studies, thinking what to do. 
uh, and I looked on the notice board, and these were in those days physical things with bits of paper pinned to them, and I saw a job advert for a research assistant in Mali uh, to work with the International Livestock Center for Africa. Uh, and I thought, oh, okay, that sounds interesting. And so I applied and I was lucky enough to get through the process. And interestingly, also the person that, I, that hired me was uh, Dr. Jeremy Swift or Professor Jeremy Swift, who as certainly in Britain is seen as one of the global uh, um, sort of researchers that really kept pastoralism on the agenda during the sort of the, the 80s and 90s when there was a lot of a lot of organizations were moving away. Uh, so I worked, I was put in this um, uh, Fulani village in northern Mali and the job was to uh, do a longitudinal study looking at uh, household economics uh, and it was there were two groups of people. There were the Fube, who are the, 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 the sort of the nobles, and then the the um, the, the Amrime Bay, who are the sort of former slaves uh, on, of of, um, of this society. And but the work was being done during. I, I sort of went out there in 19, 19, late 1981, early 1982, and stayed to just the beginning of 1984, and so coincided with this one of the big, the second sort of big drought in the, 19, in the 20th century that, you know, to hit, uh, to hit Africa. And I found it very distressing to be living in this, in this camp with, uh, during this period with great hardship and seeing uh, people um, dying, uh, livestock dying, uh, went to a lot of funerals of children and, and old people. And, 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 and working for ILCA as a researcher, which is now called ILRI, um, mm. uh, there was no mechanism for them to, to intervene in any way. They just, it was almost like, well, research this problem. And I found that very hard. And so then I went to work for Oxfam, sort of flipped over to the other side um, and worked for a while in Oxfam in, in Mali for about uh, six years, but got very disillusioned with Oxfam because in those days, at least, there was, it was all action um, without research, if you like. Um, it was doing things without necessarily reflecting on it. And in those days, there, um, there was no policy work uh, done in Oxfam. Oxfam has since changed. So I got disillusioned with that and then set up my own NGO with a colleague also from Oxfam called the Arid Lands Information Network, which was more about building capacities of what we called frontline workers the people that are at the interface between project work and communities like extension agents and, and seen them as one of the really critical people in the sort of development process as they act as that interface and yet are the least well paid, uh, the least well recognized, the ones who are least likely to get invited to an event like this. Mm. Um, and so we and we worked because it was the Arid Lands Information Network. A lot of the work was on pastoralism there to uh, start addressing some of the narratives that uh, were, were still persisting, uh, you know, about uh, this being a backward system. And then luckily did that and that was good. And then moved on to IID where I've been for the last 23 years, which <laughs> is a long time and was able to work on pastoralism there and then you know, moved around into climate change. So that's sort of my trajectory. Um, and I guess where um, things that interest me about this topic is, um, is looking at that interface between knowledge and action. Um, I, don't, I don't see myself as a research, um, as an academic. Uh, the research I do is research around how how can you do things that work in local contexts which are culturally and uh, politically possible so yeah so that's where i am at the moment and yeah so natasha what i mean i mean what brought you into pastoralism well <laughs> your career sounds quite incredible especially with like this long experience that you had and all of this stuff and i think the work that you say about, you know, bringing knowledge and policy and things mm. together, I think, uh, are really quite, quite 
relevant and especially i think for a discussion like the one that we are hoping to have today i think can also be quite uh, a way to approach things my experience mm. in pastoralism is quite recent it's uh, nowhere as uh, extensive as yours i'd say um i arrived in kutch in 2015 uh to work with pastoralists for my master's thesis mm-hmm. i didn't know anything about pastoralism and i hadn't even heard the word uh, pastoralists until i proposed to do work with them i right. mean i grew up in <laughs> urban india and uh, you know even now i don't think pastoralism or pastoralist is in common vocabulary or understanding still uh, and even when i came here i don't think i very much understood uh, more than what uh, google told me about pastoralism which was at that time i mean i hadn't researched as much but uh, when i came to kutch which is where i'm based now uh, my second day in the field there was heavy rainfall the highest rainfall mm. the region had seen in 30 years um and basically it was just a day and a half of rain but the whole desert flooded uh and they had to let out uh, they had to break the roads to let out the flood waters all of the pastoralists that i wanted to work with had left their villages and started migrating i was at this research station that had an 11 day blackout and i was really worried i was really worried and very perplexed about you know how i should go about my research whether i should even be doing it uh would it be ethical even to be asking questions at this point and things like that but then i went and i met with the pastoralists and i realized that they had completely adapted to the situation i mean they were quite confident they were not half as worried as i was they knew what to do <laughs> when and where and how and it's basically through following them from camp to camp that i understood and learned about pastoralism and i thought that was a really i mean i was very worried at the start but it ended up being quite a good way to learn about pastoralism mm. and i've stuck to it since i worked <laughs> as uh, mina said uh, at the pastoralist knowledge hub based at the un's food yeah. and agriculture organization uh, headquarters in rome and now i'm doing my phd at uh, the institute of development studies where jeremy swift was yes <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that's a connection but uh, with the pastoralist project uh, which is looking at pastoralism in six different countries okay yeah. yeah it's quite interesting jeremy i've just seen some of the names who are attending this and jeremy swift <laughs> also has contacts with him so in many way he's been a sort of father figure for certain people getting them involved in this topic yeah. yeah well what's interesting is how you know what sort of links our experience with this obviously you know it seems to be uh you as that that sort of you know massive flood event uh, that happened mm. in kutch and you know clearly marked you and mine was a, a drought uh, in the sahel and this sort of it it sort of captures i think uh what pastoralism Uh, is about and particularly in the dry land areas mm. you know these this huge variability of uh, there are periods of of uh, uh, of extreme rainfall which create floods and then the other periods of sort of much lesser rainfall that create uh, um, drought conditions and that in between you even have variability of seasons you know the dry season the mm. wet season and and that none of this is uh, stable and that you know the the uh that dry land areas and pastoralism systems that live within them are constantly dealing with this variability and and i think you know variability is such a a defining feature of of pastoralism although my feeling i think this is sort of become more of a recent understanding uh and a lot of the understanding mm. i think in the past has been that uh dry land areas are or pastoral areas are these uh it's more been defined as areas of of scarcity and and uh, uh problem areas where uh, there are things which are lacking uh and and i think has defined policy a lot and i think we'll probably talk about that a bit more uh as we you know when we start talking about climate change uh but i mean what i've learned and maybe you know it would be great to hear from you um is well it sort of builds on what you said that pastoralists have you know deal with this uh 
Um, mm. They have the institutions and the mechanisms and the strategies to navigate their way through variability, through dry seasons and wet seasons, through droughts and floods. And, and, and the evidence is that they're still there. I mean, it's been, they've been, this has been going on for a long time. And, uh, uh, but, but maybe I was going to sort of show an example from Kenya, but uh, I don't know, just quickly, I mean, is that something that you felt as well, this sort of change between, you know, seeing areas of highly variable versus uh, um, areas of scarcity and, and problem? Oh, my no. video is switched off. Oops. <laughs> there we are. No, definitely. I think, um, you know, I was reading yesterday and uh, Laila Mehta calls it regularly irregular. And I think oh, this yeah. sort of, yeah, this sort That's of variability, nice way of <laughs> fluctuation, variability, non-equilibrium, which has become the big, you know, discourse around these kind of environments. I think it really marks uh, Kutch, uh, as a, as a region, as a territory, and it's always been this kind of place that has had high fluctuation, climatic fluctuations year on year, but as well as you know spatially and intraannually. So within the year, within the seasons, from one year to the next, from one place to the next, uh, and I suppose that's why it's been such a hub or cusp of uh, mobility and nomadic peoples, uh, pastoralists. And it's host to a range of communities, uh, I think. It's a very rich uh, landscape for pastoralists in that sense, as opposed to what you were saying about how it's perceived as uh, a landscape that doesn't have uh, much or is not as productive as one would think. Yeah. And, and I think the variability is it's not just in rainfall. It's, um, uh, it's, a, it's in the landscape, it's in the soils, it's uh, mm -hmm. in the tree and in, in the vegetation. Uh, and uh, it, this and how and that interacts with rainfall and moisture and, and, and temperature and so on. So uh, I know there's been a lot of research done and some, you know, some by some great people who are uh, uh, join who are here with us, and I won't embarrass them by saying who they are. I think <laughs> probably everybody knows who they are, but very much the work of sort of valuing variability is is getting traction and and recognizing that you know in these landscapes. And I wish my my virtual background would stay because <laughs> it's got the picture of uh, of uh, Northern Mali where I was working uh, back in 1981, and sort of shows. Uh, this massive sand area with the uh, the early greening of of the of the sand dunes with 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 the first rains that come after a long dry season uh, and and how uh, you get particular species that, that grow very very quickly on these sand dunes uh, but other species take time to grow because they're in lower areas and uh, and and you know they and they may get flooded or they may not um, but it's, it, I mean, a key thing I've learned through my sort of working on this is how pastoralists are masters of managing this, this highly diverse, dynamic uh, and variable environment. Mm. And just recently we were doing, I was, doing, I was involved in some work in um, North, well, central Kenya, I guess, in the county of Isiolo, which sort of captures this. And uh, I thought I'd share just a, just um, a couple of slides on this, not because this is supposed to be a PowerPoint projection in a yeah. workshop, but I thought it just might be quite interesting to illustrate this point. So I'll, I'll share my screen just so that we can see that and, and talk you through it. I hope it will, there we go. Is that coming through? Has that come through, Natasha? Yes, I can see that. So what, what this is, and I think this is what's fascinating, and, and I think I may have shown this actually at the conference uh, back in December 2016 at the Living Lightly conference. Uh, we, we did some work um, using participatory GIS mapping. So using the old PRA techniques of asking communities but uh, uh, and, and doing resource maps, but always with this problem that government planners didn't perceive those maps drawn in the drawn in the soil or you know as real maps they were they they weren't they weren't seen as sort of proper so 
we we brought in this using GIS uh, initially Google Earth and then and then OpenStreetMaps. But what what when when we asked the the Baran pastoralists in this case um, about the different um, resources they had, what was very interesting is they started off by defining their soils, mm. um, and that's the map on the left. And the Baran have in this case in Isiolo, they had twenty five different classifications for their soil. Um, and they used the soil as the method to classify the vegetation. And then the vegetation they explained is, you know, it depended yeah. how it reacted to rainfall, whether it was good for camels, whether it was better in the rainy season or better in the dry season. And this whole complexity came out of uh, their really deep understanding. And, and, and that sort of map captures that to some extent. And the map on the right um, is looking at how they manage their environment and, and sort of there's sort of three key areas that they they explain that they they have, um, you know, the wet season grazing uh, where they 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 drive their herds and they move away from the river because I should say there is a river that runs. I don't know whether my cursor would show sort of runs roughly like that. Uh, through Isiolo coming off Mount Kenya. And so the, the rainy season pastures are these sort of white areas and that's where they live, they draw. The, the, the lighter green are the dry season pastures which are along the river. And then they have this big area up here which they call their drought reserve, which they don't use every year. And uh, in here it's, it's put far away from, from the river, far away from permanent water and it's managed through a, an, a small network of, of deep boreholes, which they remove or they sort of disable during the rainy season so that uh, there isn't a lot of water in that area during the rainy season when the grass is growing. But it, it, it shows, I mean, this, what came out of this was this, this, this really deep knowledge of how they interface with variability uh, in order to, um, uh, sort of navigate these seasons and these difficult periods. And I think we'll talk a bit later more about how that could be harnessed in a more positive way. And what is interesting is, sorry, and then I'll stop because I know it's just turning into a lecture otherwise, um, is this map, which is the, the same map of Isiolo. And we asked the, the planners at the county level to tell us what is there. And this is, I mean, it's a bit fuzzy, I'm afraid, but what they were able to focus on were the roads and the boreholes and the schools and the infrastructure. But they had no knowledge about soils, uh, about land use patterns. Um, and they said, that's all the bush. That's, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, the barren areas out there. So it's quite interesting to see. I, you know, I thought when we did this work, it sort of confirmed this uh, incredible skill pastoralists have in working with nature in a way uh, in order to you know um, get a, a livelihood but that's from India and I, uh, sorry that's from Africa I was just wondering you know in your experience uh, you know have you found similar things it's actually really really similar in India as well um, you know uh, the pastoralists I work with they classify soils as mori or karak or khari which is mm -hmm. uh, I don't know uh, bland and salty or weak and strong and yeah. uh, the sort of grasses or shrubs and herbage that grows on these soils also corresponds to this kind of you know uh, soil mix and I think pastoralists do have, as you say, these kind of uh, local knowledges and a very sort of embedded understanding of their environment that they can uh, bring to bear when they adapt to changing circumstances and fluctuations. But I also worry because, you know, we're seeing, we're talking about how they adapt to variability, but things are becoming a lot more variable or a lot more extreme let's say than they were before mm. uh, for example here in Kutch in 2018 uh, there was a drought and it was uh, the most severe drought they'd had I mean the drought uh, in 1987-88 was as severe as the drought in 2018 
but then in 2019 there was you know a long and intense monsoon it went on i mean there was the rainfall right up till december even hail uh, and in 2020 uh, there was over 300% rainfall so i mean in the past 3 years and i can see clearly how this is affecting you know pastoral practices on the ground because in the past 3 years the weather has been quite off the mark mm, mm. and i really wonder if there's some sort of limit or threshold to their capacity to adapt uh, to circumstances uh, what do you think um what well, the sort of modeling work that's gone on in africa uh, and i'm not that's not my area so i don't uh, don't you know i understand there are these climate models and they feed in data from the past and then uh, so the modeling for sort of eastern africa is 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 broadly as i understand it that very you know sort of temperatures are going to rise uh, and um, and we are going to see greater variability uh, so when it rains it will rain more when it when there's less rain there'll be you know sort of greater droughts and to a certain extent that is that we have been seeing that Uh, and there's been shifts in seasons as well so uh, the sort of short because in east africa you tend to have two rainy seasons and two dry seasons and uh, so there's been a shift in seasons which start earlier or or last uh, longer or more rain falls in the middle of it than on the edges of it uh, what so i think that's something that is uh, there we've but in many ways i would say Well, I think I think there are two debates. There's there are those people who are seeing this as the death nail of pastoralism, um, who are saying increased variability is going to finish it off. Uh, and I think you've probably seen as well, you know, um, media coverage and and research reports, uh, you know, mm. talking about climate change wars, uh, that climate change is somehow driving conflict uh, due to because of the scarcity of of natural resources of water and pasture. Uh, and therefore uh, as a consequence of climate change and I, i mean i don't fall into that camp i think and there, i think there's a growing body of people that sort of really do challenge that view uh, and 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 recognize that uh, um, that scarcity is you know very much a function of of scale of scales in time and and scales mm. in space uh, so you may have yeah. it may not rain here now but it has rained over there. <laughs> so pastoralists, you know, with their systems of, you know, sort of livestock mobility, which is one of their central ones, uh, but also, you know, other institutions of sort of negotiating access, uh, um, having reciprocal arrangements. Although I would agree a lot of these have been weakened and, you know, I think, in, you know, due to policy. So I think many people would argue that pastoralism is potentially ahead of the curve when it comes to climate change i uh, and i think in that they've been dealing with variability for a long time uh they work with nature rather than against nature uh they uh and and they have these institutions which have which have, which have proven their worth and it would be very much more about how can they be strengthened uh and you know to make them better and that and i think it's it's when pastoralism is able to function according to its own rationale and that has been a major problem it's been constrained by policy for so long but when it is able to function a, a, according to its own rationale and if we did have a positive uh, policy and legal environment that actually supported what they were trying to do and strengthened what they do rather than hinder it i think there's a much more uh, you know I think they, 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 pastoralism, you know, can uh, potentially um, um, address climate change. And, and, and very importantly, I think it's not just for pastoralism itself, it's what we can learn from pastoralism for, you know, for wider economies and societies yeah. about managing risk and that. And it's interesting, I don't know if you've seen it, there's a recent um, FAO publication called The Future of Food and Agriculture, uh, uh, you know, which, which actually... Um, sort of concludes that the whole approach to agriculture, this industrialized agri sort of agricultural approach of you know, high irrigation or maybe ranching and uh, high input agriculture, you know, has led to deforestation, has led to 
uh, land degradation, and it's not sustainable in 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 the long run. It and and that we need to find alternatives, more in more innovative ways of doing things. And I think pastoralism is exactly that. Uh, you know, can offer us that um, uh, lessons to see how to cross this uh, uh, across the climate crisis. Yeah. Mm. So I mean, that's what that, yeah. that's my feeling. <laughs> No, definitely. And I think this has also been documented about how, uh, you know, for example, and this is the big sort of uh, vegan argument. I mean, you would know in the UK, it's a very big uh, debate and mm. a very big ask uh, to ask people to go vegan. And the, the whole argument is the fact that, you know, meat production and especially industrial uh, product, livestock production is uh, damaging the environment, is raising forests and things like that. Yeah. So this has been found and but there is also growing recognition of the fact that, you know, with uh, pastoralism, you have the benefits uh, that the livestock can provide and that a sort of management system that the pastoralist practice can provide to the environment. Uh, whether it's through, you know, their manure and fertility, whether it's, you know, through the movement of the animals on the soil, uh, you know, all of that sort of uh, nutrient cycling and things like this. And there is a large body of evidence which is now coming up in uh, support of pastoralism and its ecosystem services, which is pretty great. And uh, I also wanted to say that uh, what you were talking about, learning from uh, pastoral systems, um, I think that's something that we're trying to do also through the Pastures Project uh, that I'm associated mm. with, which uh, basically stands for Pastoralism, Uncertainty and Resilience. But the idea is to look at pastoralists' as adaptive capacity uh, and their innovation and ways of uh, facing changing circumstances and to see what it is that we can learn from them and sort of apply to larger global issues, uh, different settings and social problems. So. No, I agree. I mean, I think, yes, there is a, this debate about, there was that earlier report by FAO, FAO called the long shadow, I think a long shadow of livestock, I think it was called. Um, and where livestock, you know, was being, the finger was being pointed as being a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. And, and I think what I find uh, actually very irritating <laughs> about, uh, about some of the debates around this is that we need to look where the problem came from. Um, and the problem came from, you know, the whole industrialization, uh, particularly in the North, uh, and and that applied, so it's it's not just the factories and the and and the belching out of all the uh, the smoke and the emissions and so on, but it's also the whole agricultural model, the whole development model that we have been uh, following for for several centuries now, and which is you know when when one compares that with how. Uh, family farmers, and it's not just pastoralists, I think, you know, that have a lot of lessons that uh, um, that can be shared. It's also the small scale family farmers that we see in Africa who, in dryland areas, who have a small plot. Uh, they keep livestock, they grow a variety of crops, they have a whole range of techniques for harvesting rainwater, uh, low input. And a lot of criticism of that is, well, these will never feed us. They're far too, you know, they, we uh, won't feel the world through this. And therefore we need these large scale uh, processes. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm very skeptical of that and, and would sort of challenge that to a great deal because uh, we've been saying that in the Sahel, I think it was in the 1980s or 1990s, there was a report that projected that the Sahel would not be able to feed itself by some, by 2000 or 1990 like that. And yet, yes, they are problems. Uh, I mean, it's not to say people are, are going, um, are not going hungry and there is poverty uh, in, in, in the Sahel. But I would argue a lot of that is because of the policy environment that hasn't actually supported what people are doing. Uh, and they're constant, they're not only having to deal with the environment and, 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 and uh, you know, a variability, which they can deal with, but they're being, they're, their ability to deal with that is being undermined by the sort of wider policy environment. So uh, I think it's, you know, we need a radical rethink, which a lot of people are saying, of how 
uh, you know, the agricultural model works. And climate change, there's two ways. There are some, on one side, people are seeing climate change is bringing greater risk. Let's, let's really close down and try and control nature. So there's that. And then there's the other side, climate change is there bringing greater variability. Let's learn how people are actually doing things differently and harness that knowledge uh, because it is cheaper. It is better for the environment, as you say. It, it builds on people's cultures and experience. Um, so, yeah. yeah um, but what you say is uh, quite relevant and interesting. I mean, in India, for example, it's, uh, we don't have conclusive projections for what uh, climate change might do. Uh, we have, for example, some knowledge that uh, the temperatures may rise mm. and more so at extreme temperatures. So in the dead of winter or the dead of summer, uh, it'll be hotter than it is now, but not so much at average temperatures. But for rainfall, for example, they can't have any conclusive sort of predictions. But still, as you've emphasized quite clearly that, you know, pastoralists are embedded in a wider system, you know, in wider social networks, in policy contexts, uh, and social cultural sort of milieus. Uh, and I think these are really important to also look at, because I think that somehow the room to maneuver um, is becoming constrained in some cases. For example, we have um, ecosystems that are quite sensitive, such as the desert uh, ecosystems, or uh, let's say the sub-Himalayan, Himalayan ecosystems that are very sensitive to even slight fluctuations in climate. And these are homes uh, to large numbers of pastoralists. Um, and for example, we are seeing in the Himalayas, uh, pastoralists use, uh, you know, these glacial lakes and ice bridges. Uh, to cross over from their summer to winter pastures. And, you know, there have been incidences uh, where pastoral these ice bridges have melted before time and the pastoralists have been left stranded and have had to be airlifted. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we also saw, for example, last year with the coronavirus uh, pandemic and associated restrictions then, um, there were pastoralists in Jammu who were not able to move to their summer pastures. Mm. Uh, but they complained that their winter pastures had become too warm and uh, had a lot of growth of poisonous herbage. Right. Uh, so they weren't able to feed their sheep on that because it wasn't good for them. And so mm. that kind of, you know, that was a stark sort of example of when um, it came up that a policy was directly restricting them. Uh, but in India, policies have had this sort of colonial legacy uh, where pastoralists are seen as unproductive uh, and where rangelands are seen as, uh, as wastelands. Mm. Uh, pastoralists, many of them are also criminalized or were criminalized in the past. So this sort of policy legacy continues. And although I think we've made some progress uh, with the Forest Rights Act, for example, in uh, 2006, uh, which does sort of uh, give certain rights to pastoralists to their resource bases. Um, but still, there are limitations and it applies only in very specific contexts. So generally, one would say that the policy environment is becoming narrower mm. uh, within the national context. Although internationally, one would think differently. Do you see uh, international policy discourses working differently? I think there have been changes, but I agree with you that there's been a historical legacy of which has undermined um, pastoral systems across across the world. Um, I think even um, even in Europe, um, and when and 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 that and there is still very much a very strong narrative or a perception of uh, pastoralism as backward, as unproductive, as because they move, they spread diseases, because they move, they cause conflict. Um, they are criminalized in that when, if you don't, if you don't cross the border according to the, the border, you know, according to the rules, then you become a smuggler or, uh, and so on. And it's quite interesting in East Africa, if you look at, uh, I don't know if you can visualize, the, you have Kenya and then you have Uganda, uh, and then you have a border running, 
along, you know, separating the two countries in the north. And that border runs along a ridge, uh, which separates effectively the wet season pastures from the dry season pastures and the wider ecosystem. So you have pastoralists who are now seen as from, from Karamoja, uh, when they, they used to traditionally, you know, go down, the, down into the Rift Valley, down into the plains of Turkana during the rainy season. Uh, and then and in the, and in the dry season there would be the reverse movement and the Turkana would move back up you know depending on year and you know lots and lots of factors but the fact of that colonial border has created two separate states two sep you know two separate people and has cut the ecosystem in half uh, and and I think there's similar examples between southern Ethiopia and northern Kenya uh, so I think you know, these are th this is the legacy that is there, as well as you know, forestry law, land laws, water policies, all um, veterinary policies have all come in, um, totally ignored what 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 parcelists were doing, and in that completely undermined a lot of the institutions and strategies that are there. I think things are improved. There is some improvement, I think, in the um, sort of policy environment. Um, some momentum uh, and sort of global, well, not um, certainly at the regional level in Africa, you have the African Union's uh, policy framework for pastoralism. Uh, recently, IGAD uh, passed a sort of a protocol on transhumans in West Africa. You've had a long history, you've had a, the the ECOWAS uh, transhuman certificate, I'm not sure exactly what it's called, which allows the movement of, of livestock between countries. Uh, the, the, the big challenge is implementation um, and uh, putting, uh, investing, you know, countries investing money in these policies to implement them and, imp and implement them <laughs> properly with, with, with the right knowledge and understanding. And the problem is a lot of people still have the old mindset. Uh, so either don't implement them or implement them wrongly. Um, so I think there's still a lot of work still to be done on this. Um, but yes, I mean, have you seen sort of um, progress in policies in India or, or in other parts? Um, I think... Uh... As I was mentioning that uh, in India, we have the colonial legacy for policies. Pastoralism is becoming part of national discourse. It is, it is uh, becoming a topic that is being discussed for policy issues. It is being seen now more in a positive light than before. Uh, but I think we do have a long way to go uh, in to build a certain environment that is not constraining. Uh, because I think that, you know, policy apart, I think pastoralists are also embedded in uh, social systems, in economic, political economy, political economies uh, and networks uh, that also have their own constraining factors. And in India, for example, they are embedded in such complex social and cultural milieus uh, mm. that the effect of these policies are differentiated, you know, by caste, by gender. Uh, by religion and things like that as well. And for example, I think that some of this could also be applied, uh, for example, you know, the in the Fulani area where you worked, uh, there has been now uh, quite a bit of conflict because pastoralists mm. and, you know, farmers and herders are concentrating in uh, resource rich areas. Uh, but these conflicts are also beginning to take ethnic dimensions. Yeah. Uh, so to also understand how, you know, these things are related uh, to each other, to embed policy uh, very much in its context and to be mindful uh, of local customs, practices mm. uh, and not just livelihood practices, but also how it comes together as a system, I think, is also important. I mean, I find Kenya is a really interesting example and, and I know pastors are working there. Um, so, in many respects, Kenya has a very progressive policy environment for pastoralism. You have the new constitution of 2010 that recognizes, actually mm. uses the word pastoralists in it, you know, and I don't know how many constitutions have that. Uh, it recognizes that. It recognizes the historical legacy of, um, 
of discrimination and marginalization, both political and economic. Uh, you have a, uh, an arid, in Kenya, the dry lands are called the Asaos, the arid and semi-arid lands. So you have an Asaos policy tailored to, the, to Vision 2030. Uh, you have an Asaos policy also, or a strategy, you know, which, which recognizes pastoralism, the need for mobility and so on. You have that. Uh, and you have a, a really a recent uh, gov um, sort of governance framework around devolution since 2013, where um, you have county governments and national governments, and a, a very ambitious devolution agenda, which does transfer significant, not just authority, and responsibility, but also um, resources, money to, mm. to the county governments. And that's very different to, for example, in Mali, where decentralization, the government has basically transferred all the responsibility and very little of the resources. Uh, mm -hmm. They've kept them to themselves. <laughs> in Kenya, that, that hasn't happened. So you do have county governments with annual budgets of in excess of a million pounds. Uh, you know, so, and it is a middle-income uh, middle country as well. So, you know, Kenya offers the opportunity to, you know, for, for pastoralism really to take off because pastoral citizens in the northern counties can decide on, the, on what they want, on uh, the, uh, you know, the land use systems they want, uh, the laws they want that can, that, um, and that can regulate access to water or access to vegetation. But what we're seeing is... Uh, you look at county budgets, you still see the budget in these, in these dry land areas, the budget still goes like, I'm not sure the, it depends on counties, but five times to 10 times more goes to crop farming than it does to, uh, 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 to livestock. And if it does go to livestock, it only goes to livestock in the sense of infrastructure generally. So vaccination pens and uh, mm. markets, and, then, and yet, when you talk to pastoralists, those are really not the things, uh, you know, having a, a concrete ramp is to move your, you know, to drive your animals up into the back of the truck is nice. But they can make a, an earthen one uh, with the young, you know, the, the, you know, the young lads in a, sort of a couple of hours or even less than you know, a couple of hours. Um, so they don't see that. So we're seeing this problem of um, you know, still not, you know, the mindsets and haven't changed. Uh, there's recently, you know, another example from Kenya. Whoops, I see my, let me get that back. There was, you know, there's a thing called the Community uh, Land Act, you know, which on the face of it sounds great. And there are bits of it which are really good. But it's been, it's been sort of developed within a broader legal framework of Kenya, uh, particularly around land, which sees privatization as the sort of ultimate goal. So what you're getting is um, the community land lack is almost leading to, to the balkanization of the pastoral areas, which would, you know, uh, coming back to your point about the, eth you know, making pastoralism very closely related to ethnic groups. So the idea is the community land access, sort of the Takana region will, you know, that would be yeah. their area. And next to it will be Masabit with different pastoral, you know, with the Baran or the Rendile or whatever. And it's very dangerous, this, but it comes from these mindsets which haven't yet changed. Uh, I'm very sorry about my video. <laughs> I don't know, it must be the internet. So I think, you know, one of the major challenges is about changing how people understand and think. We still haven't won that battle. Mm. Yeah. I think uh, there's a lot of parallels between Kenya or East Africa in general, but also I think Kenya and India in that sense that, you know, as you have the Assel's authorities, uh, mm. we have uh, something called the National Rain-Fed Areas Authority. Uh, the one that we correspond with on pastoralist issues in the government. Uh, there's also the devolution, the 73rd, 74th amendments to our constitution that has the Panjayati Raj system, the devolved governance system with, you know, more power given to village councils and districts and so on. Um, and the Forest Rights Act that I was talking about mm. uh, just a few minutes ago, is quite uh, strongly paralleled with the Community uh, Land Act, actually. Um, and as you say that the, 
well the logic i mean while it has provisions uh for community uh land claims and to recognize community uh land rights um it's also it also provides for individual rights and it also in a sense kind of has the neoliberal commons problem because it encloses uh, encloses areas just as you were saying that uh, it does for maybe pastoral areas in Kenya and silos them apart from each other and that doesn't always work uh, for example the pastoralists i'm working with very closely now uh, the rabari they live in multi ethnic multi livelihood villages uh, which they consider their home villages but for most of the year they are in migrating camp and uh, for most of that year they are grazing on farm residues right. uh, in this you know sort of complex uh, mosaic of tenure as uh, lance robinson would call it uh, but you know where they graze on crop residues of private farm uh, mm. owners but then also in the commons there's different kinds of administration and administrative descriptions of the commons as wastelands or either as forest lands or as village grazing lands and so on uh, so i mean uh to have let's say a fixed sort of property regime or tenure regime for them is very difficult okay, but yet yeah. uh, you know they they have been adapting really well so far uh in that sense that you know they graze their animals in agricultural hotspots and are pretty much uh, capitalizing on agricultural development uh and in that sense that their needs might be quite different for example for adapted social services or something like that mm, mm. uh you know for health for education mm. uh for that kind of thing rather than others um mm. per se uh such as for resources or for market which they manage themselves so i think you know understanding these systems uh might be useful mina so says Uh, yeah we got to finish the <laughs> <laughs> wrap up in 5 minutes okay so. i well maybe i'd i'd like to just end on a positive because i think uh, it it's it, you know with respect to climate change uh so going back to the uh, the case study that very small case study i showed about the baran we've been working with uh, county government in in isiolo as well as uh, four other counties setting up what's called the county climate change fund and it's um it was a fund which was says let's try and put into practice the principles that underpin the constitution that underpin the climate change act uh, underpin the county government act and and various other things but how can we put these principles in into practice whereby uh authority for the um the prioritization of investments is devolved to the right level it's sort of using the principle of subsidiarity you know how can we make this work in practice and the county climate change fund was a sort of a pilot that we were working on uh, so well, it started in 2010 it's now uh, in 2020 has been adopted by national government as a policy and is being rolled out through a world bank uh, loan so we which has got all sorts of other challenges but what the principles that underpin this which i think is you know which links to pastoral systems and climate change uh, and shows that things can you know there is light at the end of the tunnel and i think where i feel the, you know that pastoralism as i said earlier are ahead of the curve in leading is the county climate change fund uh, in in isiolo gave uh, at ward level with the lowest level of government um and uh, at that level were constituted uh, elected committees that brought in a mixture of customary so customary local institutions uh, uh, as well as county government so trying to bring citizen and state together in a way uh, but recognizing that at that level we need to give communities the the, uh, the authority and when they were given the authority to, to decide how to spend their money and they got roughly about 40,000 pounds every year for a number of years what was really interesting was to see how in 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 the the eastern count the eastern wards of count of of isiolo <clears throat> so the ones going east from isiolo town 
which are mainly Baran, uh, not exclusively, but mainly Baran, to see what they invested in. So they invested in a systemic way, was the first thing that was noticeable. They invested in rangeland management, in water management, and in veterinary inputs. Those are the three areas they chose. Marketing, they said, no problem. We have no problem with marketing. Uh, that's not really our problem. But we, in Isiolo, closer to Mount Kenya, it's a bit damper, wetter. There's a lot of disease, ticks, and so on. So we need... The, what they invested in was not hardware. Very little hardware. They invested mainly in governance arrangements. So for the water points, uh, if you may remember, I mentioned there was the drought reserve up to the north where they had a number of uh, deep boreholes, which were, which were under their management. Earlier, about 10, 10 15 years ago, there was a, a mega investment done with USAID funding for it, putting in some really big water pans, as they call them there. They're basically uh, big um, artificial lakes that fill up from a combination of rainfall falling on them and, and runoff. The, with their investment, they bulldozed those lakes and covered them up. They got rid of the water point and their rationale was this water was available in the wet season, therefore it was allowing others from other counties, particularly Somali from Wajir and Garissa, to graze in the, in the, in the drought reserve areas, therefore not allowing the, that stock of, of grass to grow to be available during the dry season and so on. This, of course, raises other issues about, you know, how, about exclusion. Um, and uh, there was a lot of discussion between the Baran elders with the Somali elders and uh, to say, you know, you can come and have access to our boreholes during the, during the dry season when it's bad, but we ask you not to graze here during the wet season. There, I mean, the, the Somali had their own problems because they basically, in, in Wajir and Garissa, due to a, a historical legacy of too much water, a lot of their systems have been disrupted. So it's not working yet perfectly, but the logic is there, which I think is what is really important. The other thing they invested in was, uh, which is linked to this, is um, they bought a whole load of really cheap uh, Chinese motorbikes. And they gave these to the young, to the young herders to say, we, we need you to patrol the rangelands in order to you know, in, enforce these laws about where, where you can graze and when you can't graze uh, mm -hmm. and, and bring this to the attention to the elders. Uh, as a consequence of these investments, what was interesting was a separate report done by the National Drought Management Authority as part of the early warning system found during the more recent, I think it was the drought, there was a, some, a couple of bad years in 2016, 2017, that the drought which was affected the whole of Northern Kenya, the one county which had a, a comparatively better uh, set of socioeconomic indicators was exactly this area where livestock were producing more milk, people were not needing as much food aid. So it, for me, it's a positive story that shows if you give the authority to people, you trust in people, you build on local institutions, you find ways of, of um, sharing decision making using principle of, 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 uh, of subsidiarity. You know, one can find solutions to managing you know, drought and that, which I think is, you know, will, will contribute to how these communities cross the climate crisis. That's such a great example. And that's such a, it's a really great story. Thank you for sharing it with us. And I think it's a really great moment in point to uh, sort of pause our discussion here. Yeah. <laughs> and well, thank you, Natasha. It was great, really, really interesting talking to you. I wish we could, one day we'll do it in person, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> soon, soon. <laughs> uh, Thank you so much, Seb, and thank you so much, Natasha, for this really wonderful and uh, uh, eye-opening uh, conversation. Um, and thank you for bringing in your perspectives from the kind of research that you've been doing in your uh, local areas um, 
and how communities can be engaged uh, in looking at climate change differently. Uh, we have a lot of questions <laughs> and uh, I think the very interesting questions which can further the conversation. So um, what we can do is um, I would just um, call out the name of the person who has written the question and they can ask the question themselves um, if they're still around or I can ask them. Um, so the first question is from Julia from Past uh, Pastres. Uh, Julia, would you like to ask the question yourself? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Inal. Uh, so yeah, I was just wondering, well, first of all, thanks for the very interesting conversations and sharing the experiences. Uh, it was, yeah, it was really, really interesting to, to hear the stories. And since we're talking also about um, uncertainty and the capacity really to adapt, I, from my research here in Sardinia, I also, which is a completely different context, right? In, uh, in, uh, in Southern Europe of pastoralism. But um, yeah, I did notice that uh, in, in uh, more and more areas, pastoralists are actually looking for some like stability and uh, predictable predictability. So I was wondering uh, what was your experience on this? And, uh, um, from from your experiences in the areas that you've uh, you've worked with, like which are the areas where pastoralists are actually like trying to uh, build some stability and predictability? Um, I'll have a first go, Natasha. <laughs> then uh, I think yes, there are examples. I uh, we did a study in Niger. Uh, looking at six different pastoral groups and the impact that the recent droughts have, have had there. And we found, uh, so these were Fulbe groups, so Fulani groups, uh, and some Arab groups. And we found that it was quite, it was quite complex. So there were some of these groups, and not the whole group, but households within those groups that were, um, had lost their livestock, uh, had become impoverished, where mobility was too expensive for, the, for their remaining herds, uh, they, a range of factors um, that the, some of the young people there saying, well, we can't see for us um, a future in this. Um, and therefore we, you know, going, looking for work in towns and slowly becoming assimilated there. So there were some examples of that, but then in this same study, there were the, these were particularly the Arab groups uh, that had invested in, in, in sort of higher mobility. They were investing in uh, Toyota pickup trucks um, and um, um, taking their herds far into the north of, of Niger uh, and investing in mobile water uh, uh, systems, massive bladders and things they put like um, inner tubes, if you like, um, and, and using their vehicles you know, to bring water to, um, to animals. Uh, and, and therefore still thriving very much, uh, but, you know, being far more mobile uh, and, 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 and the young there very much, you know, keeping, seeing a future in pastoralism. Uh, they were able to exploit the, you know, these more mobile ones, the, the, so the, the market differentials between livestock prices and cereal prices in, uh, in, um, in um, northern Nigeria. Uh, so they were bringing cattle, bringing their cattle down just at the right moment when prices were high and grain was was cheap. So I think it's a very, my experience, it's a very varied picture. It's not that uh, that all pastoralists are looking for, you know, settling down. Uh, in some places they've been constrained. If you look at southern Kenya, uh, in the Kajiado and Narok areas, you know, largely due to the policies of the group ranches, which uh, effectively destroyed the sort of communal land tenure system and the and the and the mobility of animals. There, you've got a, a situation where uh, pastoralists, um, you know, are much more sedentary in that. Interestingly, they are now trying to actually, through the group ranches and the privatization of land, trying to negotiate sort of livestock mobility corridors across private properties. Um, so they're trying to get the animals, they're still, they're still trying to get the animals to, to be more, more mobile, even if them as people are staying 
uh, are, are, are more sedentary. I mean, uh, also similarly to Seth's example, the Rabari that I work with here, they say, Mal ne ja pogar wo hai tia poge, which basically means that the animals will go wherever we want them to reach. So, I mean, <laughs> the same thing, the, the mobility is not something that they have a problem with. And in fact, uh, they, they would continue to be mobile because, you know, they want that kind of uh, nutritious, fresh fodder that is available at agricultural hotspots, as well as the reciprocal arrangements for manure exchange that they get at these agricultural hotspots. So they would continue to be mobile and prefer to do so. Uh, but for example, uh, there have been in the past years a lot of strain on the relationships uh, and especially coming uh, because their animals, especially the small ruminants in Gujarat, are considered unproductive. Uh, and they have no favorable policies, but they have uh, negative policies that, that block their trade and so on. And so that's one of the constraining factors. And I suppose in that area of trade is where they would want more stability besides education, I think, which is another priority area. Um, Um, thanks, uh, said and Natasha. Uh, next, we have Amit Solanke. Um, Amit? Uh, yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm a student at uh, Zim Premji University in Bangalore. And uh, I had a, uh, I'm currently working on agroecology, so I had a question linked to it. So uh, since we know that agroecology is now turning out to be like a promising front uh, and it's uh, focusing not only on food security, but it has some elements that can benefit uh, uh, pastoralism also. So uh, I just wanted to get a sense from uh, you, uh, what sort of interventions do you think are necessary in, to be in place to merge uh, agroecology and pastoralism? Do you want to go first, Natasha, <laughs> or take it? <laughs> I suppose, I mean, uh, this is a conversation that was very hot when I was at the FAO, uh, because it was the year of agroecology when I was there. Uh, and we very strongly promoted pastoralism as a best case practice for agroecology, because if you see uh, pastoral practice, uh, it's not it's not input intensive, uh, you know, it, uh, it works very closely to the environment. It's very receptive to changes in uh, the landscape and things like that. So in every sense, it's an agroecological practice in itself. And I think uh, we have more to learn from pastoralists uh, in terms of how systems could be made agroecological, quote unquote, uh, than to apply any sort of agroecological strategies to pastoralism. That would be my take on it. At least. And I would uh, endorse that. <laughs> I think just maybe a small point, also the notion of food security. Uh, it's often, I don't know in India, but certainly in countries like Kenya, food security is associated with the production of crops. Um, so if you don't grow maize, which is their main crop, then you're food insecure. And, and the failure to understand you know, the contribution that pastoralism makes in an agro, you know, in the low input uh, way to, to food security. I hope, Amit, that helps, <laughs> helps answer, some, answer your question. Yes, yes, it does. Thank you. Uh, Jilo from Kenya. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, would you like to ask your question? Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you, Menal, Sid, and uh, Natasha. Uh, glad to be in this uh, uh, session and uh, very happy to hear Said you seem to know a lot about uh, Kenya. Uh, I come from uh, Marsabit. Uh, mm -hmm and uh, from the Gabra tribe of mm -hmm. Northern Kenya. And uh, uh, all you have said about, uh, you know, pastoralist in Kenya policies and how, you know, the, the government uh, actions are, are true. 
And uh, my question was about the future of pastoralism, given uh, the policies that are there. It's true that uh, Kenya constitution has the word pastoralist in it, but the main issue is how, I mean, the implementation. And uh, uh, for instance, uh, pastoralist policy, policies are not made with the pastoralist in mind, for example, uh, one major aspect of pastoralism is uh, nomadism, moving around. And uh, given that, uh, you know, the world is now moving, I mean, uh, there's the education and uh, our education system doesn't have pastoralism, nomadism in mind, and uh, which creates a dilemma of which way to go. Should we keep pastoralism? and miss uh, education, modern education, or we abandon pastoralism. So in terms of uh, uh, the policies that are there, vis-a-vis -vis the need of pastoralism, what is the future? I, think, I mean, I, I don't feel qualified to answer on behalf of pastoralists in Kenya. Um, I think... I think there is clearly there are they are futures. There are all sorts of futures uh, that are there. Uh, in 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 the broader sense, I think it, in at uh, it's it's for for citizens within Kenya, and it's not just pastoralists. I think it's also small scale family farmers. You know, are another area. Uh, uh, slum dwellers, you know, they are still groups of marginalized communities um, that are not benefiting from the policy environment in Kenya that offers. So it's it's a strong political process, I think, is part of it. It's, it we need, you know, citizens at county level really do need to um, engage with with what's available to them. Uh, uh, there are the the laws for uh, for um, public participation. Counties are supposed to, you know bring out their own laws for 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 um, public participation i know i know takana has i'm not sure about masabit uh, so i think you know there is that process of engaging with policy on the education uh, issue i mean there was work done by uh, colleagues uh, severio kratley among uh, others that supported the nomadic commission in kenya and and the approaches it's not modern education and then leave pastoralism i think that has been you know the the view but there are ways you know uh, citizens living in pastoral communities should have just as much route right to um an education as anybody else and the it's it's how you tailor that education to fit that 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 community and the nomadic Com um, education commission did come up with a strategy looking at uh, distance learning, building on experiences from Australia and uh, Switzerland, uh, looked at boarding schools, uh, looked at mobile teachers, and and you know and looking at actually is there a way that all of these three need to be combined in a way um, to you know to enable pastoral children, particularly for primary school education, to be taught in their own language around uh, you know, on issues which which are relevant to them because I think. It's, it's not just the problem of how you deliver education in pastoral areas, it's the content of that education as well. And, and, the, and, the, and that second point is a real problem. Uh, the, you know, I'm, I don't have in my mind the actually primary seven sort of syllabus and that, but I know uh, in other countries like Uganda and Tanzania, um, it contains you know, examples of things like pig, pig farming, um, uh, 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 poultry cultivation, uh, um, poultry rearing, uh, growing maize, things which are either uh, sort of religiously um, pro unproblematic or which have no bearing whatsoever on those people's lives. And the, the content of the ed education actually contributes to, to pastoral youth being, being uh, separated from their culture, um, not, not, um, um, not having pride in their culture because they're being taught that it's it's a bad thing and i think you know there's a lot of work that needs to be done on the the actual content as well as the actual the, you know how it is delivered um we have vivek negi next vivek yeah hi like uh, so i had a question regarding the you know the parameters or factors which may lead to the resilience of the pastoralist communities 
in their socio environmental setup and what what are the uh, due to two things first is environmental stress and the second is economic cut off from the mainstream economy of the you know region so within these two uh, like uh, domains how would what things would lead to the resilience in those communities thank you sorry one was no, like, I'll, let, I'll let you go as i spoke last time <laughs> no i just wanted to clarify the question yeah. uh, he spoke of two domains vivek uh, one was economic and the second one was the first first one was the environmental stress which you know maybe climate or water or something yeah i think um something that we had begun speaking about uh was about the adaptability of pastoralists to variable conditions not just environmental variability but also market fluctuations and economic uh, variability and things like that and there are many strategies that pastoralists would deploy uh in these cases also market based strategies um so i think in different uh, settings there are different uh, and interesting examples to be given um and for example this past year with the corona virus pandemic uh you can consider that as an extreme sort of case of variability or uncertainty uh and look at that uh, and the experiences of the past year to see how pastoralists have responded uh to quite an uncertain circumstance and see that uh for example when trade was blocked many of them have uh held on to their stocks uh hoping for better prices or have made alternative market arrangements um and things like that um and sort of uh connecting both the environmental and economic aspects so while uh, for example uh, there was the sort of restrictions on mobility pastoralists that i work with the rabari continued to be mobile and actually made uh, mobility decisions based on the weather uh which sort of uh, for example was in their favor in the past years and uh, allowed for them to be uh, grazing closer to their uh, home villages for longer so that their out migration was for a much shorter period uh during the corona virus pandemic so pandemic related lockdown related restrictions impacted them much lesser because you know the climatic conditions were in their favor so i think uh, when you look at uh, the nexus of all these factors coming together you find that there are many strategies that one could apply i think maybe the only thing i would add is that you know contrary to a lot of perceptions pastoralists are really well integrated into markets the markets are very important to them um amongst the masai of northern tanzania i remember sitting in um in one of the the bars with a, a colleague and uh, uh he he was a masai colleague um uh, we were working together and a, his friend a friend came along and sat with him and this big guy uh wearing pretty shabby clothes uh, uh an old hat and as he sat down and then we had a he ordered a drink and he brought out of his pocket three three mobile phones and uh they talked a bit but the rest of the time this guy was on his phones and then and i didn't know what was going on uh when he left i asked the lias uh, my friend i said what was all that about and he said that man is a new jerusi a new jerusi is a masai term for a livestock trader it's a customary it's a traditional institution and he was on the market he said he had three phones because we each there was one phone for tanzania one for kenya and one for uganda and uh and that's how he did it and he was linked into these markets and his talking was finding out the, about the prices of different types of livestock and he was talking to Elias to say I would like to buy you know some of your livestock because or, or I can tell you where you can sell your livestock if you want and so I think uh the use of mobile technology now uh you know is a major factor in helping you know to a certain extent uh dealing with economic stress Uh, we have kimji bai next uh, natasha 
would you want to ask him in gujarati if he would want to speak yes uh, kim ji bhai has asked this question also in english actually above where he says uh, have you noticed any good prospects for selling wool or making wool etc um i mean uh, i think this is a bit off topic but in that sense that uh, in terms of uh, livelihood diversification uh, one has found uh, here in india um, the wool trade has uh, almost collapsed for many of the sheep breeds uh because uh, you know the international competition is quite high with uh, you know wools from other countries but as well as with synthetic fibers uh and you know just because of technical specifications of length and things like that i think that uh, the capacity of the wool to be uh, used is quite limited but i think one of the things that we can look forward to perhaps in this regard is uh, technological innovation and perhaps if we look back at uh, pastoral practices and how they would use their wool products how they would uh, you know make yarn uh, and wool other wool based products um, and derive technologies that could work uh, along with uh, pastoral practices at a local level uh, then we might be able to rebuild or revive uh, the wool economy but i think this kind of applies also uh, to other sectors and other sort of adaptations to look more at local innovations and to build those at a scale that works hand in hand with pastoral practices rather than a more industrial for example scale that works um we have a question by vasant and i think he is left so i'll just read it out uh vasant says does growing sedentarization among pastoralists even as a climate scenario worsens do you see ways by which settled pastoralists might return to pastoralism should opportunities elsewhere not pan out i think i mean we sort of answered that with the sardinian with our colleague from sardinia um you know there will be i think you know there will be some um there will be partialists that sedentarize they may sedentarize permanently they may sedentarize uh for a certain amount of time i i suspect there's going to be you know a lot of uh um a lot of um, sort of variability or a lot of uh, variety on this and it's not new it's is you know we've seen this in the past in in previous years uh in previous certainly in the sahel uh you know, pastoralists that have uh sort of sedentarized for a, a temporary bit and others then that has become permanent for them uh so i yeah it's not something i've researched a lot on so i don't feel that comfortable um you know giving a definitive answer it's i've just seen a few case a case uh, sort of case examples but it's um it you know there will be i think it's as I said earlier even if people sedentarize the livestock are likely to remain mobile and uh, i suppose uh you know together with what said said i think to sedentarize or not is obviously personal choice and everybody is free to make that choice for themselves uh with you know with the population increasing as well as livestock population increasing one needs to also think of uh for example diversification within household uh, economies and like uh, splitting of uh, livelihoods um and to see if actually uh, there is a decline in pastoralism or not uh but the other thing to bear in mind for example is that uh, with the community that i work with uh pastoralism still is the most lucrative profession economically so even if it's not something that they would want to do aspirationally uh it's something that they continue doing uh to meet uh, their livelihood uh, needs uh 
uh, what would be, I think, a direction in which to move is to how to make this also an aspiration and how to make it desirable. Uh, and I think part of it is uh, to work uh, in reframing the narratives, current narratives around pastoralism, but as well as infusing some dynamism into uh, the livelihood in itself uh, through new practices and products and things like that, that perhaps the youth themselves could take on. Thank you. Um, we have Grazia next. Hi, thank you so much for what, um, but the organization of the dialogues and uh, all the examples you have uh, offered. I think you have already provided some form of an answer to my question, but I was um, wondering if uh, you have some specifics about um, pastoral institutions and how and whether and how they are changing uh, today under both all the issues of modernity that we have discussed and uh, ecological change in particular. Uh, pastoral institutions and in, sorry, just Grazia to understand in in with respect to yeah uh, ways, of, um, ways of taking decisions, ways of mm -hmm. implementing decisions, like for the Boran would be the GDA systems or things of the sort. I mean, is there any change, for instance, under the impulse of um, the technological? novelties that have been introduced that you talked about? I think in my experiences, there is, um, it, again, it's varied. So there are uh, some of the institutions are very, are very um, specific to that particular culture. Um, and so the Baran institutions of the Deda, for example, a, are not recognized by the Somali or the Rendile. They may know about them, but they're not necessarily adopted by those uh, sort of different pastoral groups. I think they're coming under a lot of pressure. They've had they've had pressure from the past, and I think they're coming under internal pressure now, particularly from youth. Uh, there's a sense of you know as uh, you know youth want um, want to have um, decision making powers and that, uh, and it it's the strength of those institutions for them to change internally. So the one example I do know of is in northern Tanzania, where uh, I went to um, uh, a community. Now, the pastoralists there are relatively settled. It's an example. I mean, the animals are quite mobile, but the pastoralists, they still have wet season and dry season uh, camps and so on, but, but only for the young men. Uh, the, the older people tend to stay put in their bomas, uh, in their main homesteads for most of the life. What we saw, what I saw in this particular area was um, in livestock marketing institutions. So they, they set up, uh, I would, they were sort of hybrid um, um, institutions where you had a, a group of old men that, that used their sort of traditional um, system of the elders uh, to make marketing, marketing decisions. But they had alongside that a women's marketing group and a youth's marketing group. The youth marketing group was just young men um, and, and, and the women's was both old and younger women. And, and that was an innovation, I think, you know, in recognition that uh, not all, all marketing decisions uh, and support for that you know, would be done by the, the, you know, the elder men of, of that community. I suspect that is due to the vision, the, the openness uh, of key individuals. Um, and uh, and and the exposure of that community, you know, to to the benefits of of working this way. There might be other pastoral areas, maybe where that is much much more difficult, where uh, there isn't so much innovation. But I don't know. Okay. Well, um, in my personal experience. Uh, again, this is a very broad question, as Ed was saying, and I think that there are many differentiated impacts. I mean, uh, for example, 
an institution has many components and might make many, many different types of decisions. Something might be affected in some way and not in another way, and something else might be affected in some other way. Uh, what I found, for example, I've worked closely with two communities and they're quite different. Uh, one of the communities is quite hierarchical and the other one makes more sort of uh, small group autonomous decision making. And I found that where the structure was more hierarchical, at least it was the changes uh, that you're talking about in terms of like the new technologies and you know stuff like that was having a more uh, stronger impact because uh, the differentiation was quite stark. Whereas you know where decision making was being made in small groups autonomously, uh, this sort of fed into uh, collective decision making and everybody had access, so it worked. Um, so that's just two bits to it, but also these structures, these institutions are shaped uh, by local conditions, by their geography, by their practices, by, uh, let's say, the sort of uh, socioeconomic context that they face and things like that. So I think this is a difficult question to answer straight forward. Uh, we have Mashresha from Pastress, um, Masresha, okay, I guess I can ask this question. Um, despite the fact that pastoralists have been embracing irregularity, how these irregularities and unpredictability of natural events like drought or flood, disease or locust, shake the existing adaptive capacities across different pastoral areas in the world. In Borana of Ethiopia and Kenya, in the last 18 months, drought, flood, locusts, conflict and mobility uh, due to COVID-19 have taken place. So basically, how do irregularities uh, shake adaptive capacities? I'm trying to, <laughs> uh, I've, I found the question. I'm just trying to. Have happened, yeah. I, I, I'll make a start, but I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Um, so I think what we've we've seen that they are uh, under. You know, I think we need to look at this when when you have a functioning pastoral system that is able to work according to its own logic and its own rationale uh, and is not constrained that we do see that they you know that there is a capacity to deal with um, uncertainty uh, the pastoralist systems tend to be about dealing with uh, real time management of what is happening uh, it's investing in in that uh, that said they i i i think they have longer term strategies as well. So if we were to look at uh, on livestock breeding, for example, or livestock selection is probably a better word. Uh, there are examples in East Africa where pastoral communities have shifted. So the Baran are another example of this, where from a, being previously a cattle, mainly a cattle rearing community, they're increasingly adopting, you know, investing in camels as a sort of a longer term strategy of how to deal with uh, climate uncertainty going forward. Uh, there is other examples from around the world where um, pastoralists are investing in, in sheep, or not sheep, uh, goats. Uh, in Senegal, slightly differently, you're finding pastoralists are investing in, in sheep, uh, mainly for market opportunities 
and seeing due to the, the fluctuations of market prices around sheep that they can be, uh, great profits can be made at certain times of year. So sheep prices peak at religious festivals in particular. Uh, so pastoralists are investing in those sheep which are most prized for that. Uh, so I think there is a combination of a, another long-term investment, if you like, as an institution is on reciprocal arrangements and investing in, 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 in the social uh, relations that you, um, that you have to have. So I think these things are going on uh, a long time alongside that real-time management. So if you are able to invest in livestock that can travel great distances with little water as camels are, it gives you that opportunity when there is a drought to respond uh, quickly. If you've also invested in your social relations to allow you to move to from this area to that area. So I think there is this constant uh, investment in these, uh, you know, through these institutions in order to maintain your options, to have these multiple options open. I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's answered what this question was looking for, but that's, that's how I've understood it. Yeah. I would answer quite uh, briefly, I think. Um, I suppose with the many things that uh, Master Asia is talking about in terms of drought, flood, locust, conflict, COVID-19, all of these things. So what we are seeing is that, you know, that variability is not just in environment or uncertainty is not just in climatic conditions, but also in socioeconomic conditions. Um, and so, I mean, you see that all of these are tied in together in a sort of web uh, of, uh, let's say, uh, determinants, char characteristics, factors, so on, uh, influences. Uh, but the same way, uh, pastoralists also operate uh, within a web, uh, with a web of strategies. Um, and uh, they flexibly deploy strategies. They can move from, let's say, one node to another node flexibly to respond to uncertain circumstances. So uh, just to say that as these uh, variabilities come together, pastoralists respond uh, or have their own internal variabilities in response strategies uh, to respond to external variabilities. Thanks, Seda Natasha. We also have two more questions now. Uh, Bhageshri has asked the next question. Bhageshri, would you want to ask it yourself? Bhageshri? Um, okay, I'll read it out. Bhageshi says that despite semi-nomadic people in India who have been trying for their identity and livelihoods, because they don't stay in one place, they do not have an identity proof card. They are ignored by government and others. Uh, what's your view on this? So I think it is addressed to Natasha. I think, I mean, Said and I have also spoken about this in uh, the context of Africa as well, where uh, identity cards are very place-based, location-based, uh, and also allow for benefits within uh, limited geographical areas. So this has been somewhat of a problem always with uh, pastoralists and nomadic people in general, where they aren't able to access services. Um, I suppose that this is something that's, uh, come to be quite well recognized within the Indian context. Uh, there has always been calls for universalizing social services, which is one way uh, to sort of uh, ensure that uh, the safety net is extended to cover everybody. Um, and at the same time, uh, one should also recognize that given the historic context of mobility within which pastoralists are embedded, 
they have also come to form you know their own systems through which uh, they might sort of receive these benefits so for example the pastoralists i work with uh, receive grain in exchange uh, of their manure uh, and so have a uh, lower reliability on the pds system uh, but at the same time they also have uh, brick and mortar homes uh, within their villages through which they access uh, the pds system when required uh, so again uh, the simple answer would be that we need to work better to ensure that social services reach uh, all kinds of people. Uh, we'll take the last question uh, by Pranav. Um, I guess I can ask it. Um, is climate variability or policies of monocultures within climate agenda putting pressures on grazing lands and diverting migration routes for pastoralists? Uh, how to ac access their resilience when their routes are changing? Um, so the first part of the question, sorry, Natasha, <laughs> shall I go first? No, go for it. Okay. okay. Yes, please. Uh, I think the first part of the question is yes, um, policies that is, uh, are uh, you know, government policy investing in what they perceive uh, to be uh, investments that will stabilize the environment, that will somehow uh, address climate change. So irrigation is a very good example, um, you know, that, that still continues. That, and, uh, but that is not a, um, a recent development. This has been going on for decades. Um, if you, you know, all um, in Africa, and I believe in countries like Iran and, and Pakistan and India, and I, I suspect you know, irrigation has always been seen as a, uh, um, an investment that will uh, bring um, stabilized environment, ensure food production and therefore food security. Um, and we've seen the limitations of that. Uh, that has put pressure on, on the gra grazing lands. There's also um, other other pressures that have happened over time where which leads to the fragmentation of of the grazing land so in ethiopia a good example is along the awash river uh, there's been huge investment in irrigated sugarcane um, irrigated rice and and other crops and, and this has completely disrupted the um the the seasonal movement of animals that depended on the on on the river during the dry season, that allows them during the rainy season to exploit this much much bigger area, where there is no permanent water during the rainy season when you find water. Uh, if we remember from the Isiolo example, you saw how pastoralists, you know, their dry season grazing was along the uh, along the Iwasunira River, there. I mentioned also the example from Senegal uh, along the river Senegal, I think, where you know, rice cultivation has completely um, disrupted the system. So I think uh, the answer is yes. I think the, the knee-jerk reaction from government now uh, is we need more of these big infrastructure projects due to climate change. Uh, and I think you know, there's, we need to actually make the, you know, push back hard against that because it, in the long run, we know it, it will not work. Uh, it goes back to that FAO report, which says, you know, we need innovative solutions. The business's usual approach to doing this is not a solution going forward. Uh, I do agree with said with this answer, and I think that obviously these monoculture uh, monocultures will add a lot of pressures and be harmful also to the environment in the longer run. Um, in my experience, uh, for example, as I've said also before, uh, the Rabari pastoralists that I work with uh, are able to thus far at least capitalize somewhat on these agricultural development as they feed on crop residues in cotton monocultures and wheat monocultures. Uh, and they are benefiting also from uh, canal irrigation that is coming through the Narmada project because this has ensured that fodder is available even in dry years as long as they are willing to move 
uh, they are able to access water because of these uh, developments. Uh, what this does do is that it, you know, because uh, this sort of infrastructure is available, um, farmers are under pressure also to perform and to be, you know, yeah. making the most of their lands and stuff. So the relationship between farmer and herder is being constrained, uh, is, uh, you know, having increasing pressure, even when, uh, let's say, grazing resources are available or mobility practices and routes are available. So I think these relationships need to be safeguarded uh, in a way that, you know, these reciprocal arrangements can continue. I hope that somewhat answers the question. Uh, so we've addressed most of the questions that have been sent and it's been two hours since we've, we have been talking. <laughs> um, we wouldn't want this to end because it was a very, very rich discussion and we are thanking the, we are really thankful to the participants and also the kind of diverse questions that they've asked uh, because it was extremely interesting to um have your perspectives on these uh, on these questions. So thank you so much, Natasha and uh, said for uh, giving us your time and uh, engaging in this really rich discussion and uh, everybody else also. Uh, this is being recorded and it will be put up on YouTube um, uh, as were our earlier dialogues. And we hope to see everybody soon with the next set of speakers. So thank you so much. And we'll end the uh, meeting here. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much as well for everybody. It was good fun. Thank you, Natasha. Thanks so much, Fed. <laughs> thank you. Okay, then. Have a good weekend, everyone. <laughs>